I'm Jason LaRocca. This is Fab Factory Studios in Los Angeles, California, where uh, I am very happy to call home uh, since 2017. I have worked with a number of different artists. I've gotten to mix for Jay-Z, CeeLo, Fiona Apple, Serge Tankian. Primarily do a lot of work in film, TV, and video game scoring. Projects like Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power, Dungeons and Dragons, Honor Among Thieves, Assassin's Creed, Fortnite, and God of War Ragnarok. Well, my parents were sort of avid music listeners, so I grew up listening to my dad's vinyl collection, and he had a lot of Beatles records, and, you know, my mom listened to a lot of Joni Mitchell, and, you know, we had Led Zeppelin records, Frank Zappa records, and all that stuff was kind of always playing somewhere around the house and, and I got really into especially the Beatles at a young age and somewhere in my early teens you know picked up a guitar and decided I wanted to be a rock star and take a shot at at uh, doing the club circuit as it were and we did a lot of like you know playing the Sunset Strip and that whole thing you know growing up in LA and um, I sort of found my way into uh, the film world sort of by happenstance. It wasn't really something that was planned. I had a friend of mine in a band that we were playing around LA with said, hey, I've got this film composer I'm working for named Mark Isham and you know, I'm, I'm gonna be leaving that job position and maybe you'd like to meet him and see if it's sort of a fit for you. And I thought, you know, this would be a great opportunity for me to try and get into the studio world, which I love but didn't really have uh, any real knowledge of, of how a professional studio really kind of worked. I had my own sort of home studio where I was doing like DIY, kind of like making records myself, you know, for, you know, my punk band and stuff like that. But like, we weren't really, uh, we weren't really able ever to like afford being in like a really cool studio. So this was, to me, I thought my opportunity to kind of hopefully get myself in the door. And, and I did end up interning for uh, for this film composer and that was kind of what led me down a totally different path which was in the film and tv world when i was 18 in 1998 uh, and i got to learn basically he had just purchased the euphonic cs 3000 console which was like the first digitally controlled analog console that had, was able to really fulfill all the needs for for post-production and nobody really knew how to use it so I kind of did a deep dive into the console and kind of made myself invaluable in his studio. And from there, you know, we developed a great relationship. I ended up in you know, my band got signed. We went on tour for a while and I did the rock thing for a while and touring full time was great, but I kind of wanted to settle down and become more of a, of a studio rat. I think what changed for me was that I've always had a real love for studio production and especially recording and, and mixing bands and, you know, uh, working with organic music and material and lust for gear, which, you know, I think was a big part of it for me too. I had uh, an engineer by the name of, of Steve Krause, who I was kind of my mentor for a while and, and I really admired his his mixing skills and he had tons of outboard gear and i remember thinking damn dude i gotta get that shit like i gotta i gotta get some some compressed some neve compressors and some 1073s and uh that's kind of like my thing so i always had these two kind of worlds where it was like writing and being in a band and just loving gear and the mixing side of it too and uh i think i just felt like being a studio guy and being able to sort of stay in one place and not necessarily travel the world all the time was just kind of what brought me back to the other side of the glass, I guess. And um, yeah, somewhere in, I guess, 2010, uh, I started to get more into production full time. And, you know, one thing sort of led to another and I've kind of ended up where I am now by just sort of weird happenstance, I suppose, to some degree. Just a man, a deadly scene, a weathered bean. Men must cry, we soldiers lie on threatened land. My guns go bang, I can make the guns go bang.
Well, when I was kind of trying to make it as a quote unquote freelance engineer, um, you know, I, I, I guess one of the first things that I did that I think sort of put me on the map a little bit was I started to work on this show called, you know, CSI Miami, which was like this big show at the time that I was actually a big fan of and got to work on that with the composer of the show at the time. His name was Jeff Cardoni. And um, after that, I kind of started to pick up steam with like other composers around LA. I ended up getting my first kind of big orchestral gig when I did um, uh, Once Upon a Time, a show for Disney ABC that ran for seven seasons that was purely an orchestral score. And, uh, you know, was recording and mixing the music for that for, you know, the better part of seven years. And that kind of, I guess, was when I started to really get more down the road of kind of recording large orchestral scores and mixing things like that in, in surround and stuff like that. I had done little, you know, sort of things that led up to that, but I feel like that was kind of a, a moment for me when I started to see the snowball effect of, of kind of, you know, pushing myself out there as a freelance engineer. One of my best memories, you know, on a recording and mixing session for a film was uh, definitely when I got my first opportunity to go to Air Studios in London and record orchestra for like six days and then and then mix the score for Paddington uh, was a huge sort of like, whoa moment for me. Because, you know, I actually not too long before that had heard the score for Inception, which was incredible. And I thought this is like, you know, setting the tone for where film score is going. And it was all recorded at air. And then going there, you know, a few years later and getting to actually record and mix there myself, I was like, this is, this is absolutely incredible. That was really a moment that has stuck out to me. It's just one that, that sense of exhilaration and excitement of, of doing something where you never thought you would get the opportunity to, and then actually having it happen. My proudest career achievement. Well, you know, I think that there's probably something to be proud of for a lot of different projects for a lot of different reasons, but probably one of them that sort of comes to mind immediately is just working on the Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power project was a proud moment for me in that it was a really massive undertaking in terms of the scope of what we were doing. And just up from a music side, you know, that we were basically producing almost 10 hours of music for this show. And I've never actually done a project that's had that much material for it, you know, and, and to do something that's that long is kind of, you know, you, when you're in the middle of it, you almost don't see where the end of it is. And when you get to the end of it, you're like, wow, this is incredible. It feels like a real sense of accomplishment. And so to have stuck through from the beginning to the end of that project and looked at it at the end thinking there isn't a single thing I would change about it. Like we just did exactly what we set out to do and, and got even more out of it. And so that's uh, definitely a, a proud uh, achievement for me. Yeah, I mean, working on film and TV and video games versus working with artists is, it definitely has its own set of challenges that are different. I think probably one of the, the biggest things is is the, uh, you know, the time factor in working on film and TV uh, and post production is is usually one of the biggest factors in the whole concept of of how you approach it. And you know, we know that at a certain point we have to have something delivered and working backwards from that you know the template the uh, plugins we use the the system for how we get it from point a to point b is pretty systematic and you know because we know that one way or the other we have to achieve a goal of sonic perfection within a very certain amount of time regardless of any obstacles and so you know with making a record you know, generally there's kind of sometimes the opposite where you have sort of infinite time to kind of work on something and make it sort of just the way you want, which is great in its own way. But the technical approach um, tends to be 
a little bit more rigid on film score and TV and, and video games because we know we have to meet certain deadlines. So I pick certain plugins, certain outboard gear, certain session templates that are going to really be solid, really work well, and not ever give me any issues because I know that A, I want a really good starting point so that we're already kind of like 40% of the way there, but then knowing also that if we're working it you know, two in the morning or three in the morning and we have got to deliver this in the next two hours, I don't have anything in my sessions that's going to give me any shit, you know, and that it's going to be something that is rock solid, works perfect. And so there's not not to say that we don't experiment. It's just that there's a there's a mindset of, you know, we're kind of in the trenches and, you know, we got to just do what's tried and true, <laughs> you know, to some degree. One of the challenges I face when mixing, I mean, there's there's creative challenges, there's technical challenges. I think one of the technical challenges is that, you know, a lot of uh, sessions, especially for film, TV, and video game scoring is, these sessions tend to be really, really large and, and have track counts up to, you know, a couple thousand tracks. And one of the technical challenges is not only, well, how do you figure out how to play back all those channels, but, but weed through them and, and take things out that you don't need and manage it so that sonically it's something that is usable. Because, you know, I think at the end of the day, there's, there's maybe, you don't need all 60 microphones on the orchestra. Maybe you only need a handful of them. And what can you start to commit to getting rid of? And so definitely in film, TV, and video game, that's one of the challenges is like, technically how do we fit this into this session and also how you know creatively how do we start to weed this thing out fast and make it start to make sense you know for sure i mean there's also the factor that you know you've got a lot of creative input from a lot of different people and how do you make everybody happy you know and i think um first and foremost i mix something till i'm happy with it and then from there I will make any changes necessary to make other people happy. And you have to kind of just be okay with letting go completely of your mix or what you thought was the right way to do something and do it exactly the way somebody else wants it. Because that is ultimately what you're doing in, in post-production is you're, you know, you're providing a service for somebody. What you want is fine. And you can certainly give your input on technical aspects of that, but creatively, you know, you're servicing somebody else and have to be willing to let go of what you think might be the approach. You could think your mix is fantastic and it doesn't matter because if if the artist doesn't like it, you have to be willing to think, well, how can I make this better? That's actually, I think, a, a good word of advice I've been given in the past. It's like somebody told me, you know, uh, every every time you get shot down, there's an opportunity to do it better the next time and better for yourself, not necessarily just better for, for the artist, but you can actually find something in it that you can improve. And I think that's, um, that's definitely something I, I feel like I've had to learn over the years because I, I feel very attached to something emotionally and you have to sort of become unattached from it and then sort of find some inspiration in it again to kind of make it better and, and improve upon it. So, yeah. I have a couple of digital signal chains that I really like. I have a EQ called the uh, DMG Quality that I really, really love. It's kind of a surgical EQ that I use for most of my basic cutting and carving and um, you know bus processing as far as EQ goes. I have one Steven Slate plugin, which is the VMR, and that's the only one I own. And I love just the Neve setting on it, and that's that's the only one I use for that. Analog signal chain wise, I mean, if I'm recording something, you know, like orchestra, that's a pretty simple signal chain. And I sort of consider the microphone part of the signal chain where I would basically have like, for instance, recording the orchestra, the Deca tree, the basic overall sound of the orchestra would be my M50s into Grace microphone preamps straight to tape. Pretty simple signal chain. I love my 
Manly Verimu for actually recording. I don't really use it much for mixing these days, but for a signal chain on front end, I'll use like a Neve 1073 into a Manly Verimu, uh, maybe a Pultec EQ. I like that signal chain for a lot of different things, for bass and vocals, guitars, you know, anything soloistic. My signal chain does change from style to style for sure. Like if, like if I'm doing a mix that, for instance, like if there's a score for a film and it's comedic uh, in nature, and and it's sort of a sort of a happy sort of fun music score, generally that also means from a mixing perspective we're going to be drier. There's going to be less reverb. There's going to be more. If it's an orchestral score, there'll be more use of spot microphones and less use of room microphones and that sort of thing. It's a different perspective versus you know something like maybe the Lord of the Rings or something like that, where that's all about the room size of a giant room like Abbey Road One or Air or something like that, and and it's all about adding space, adding depth, adding size to make it as you know, lush and magical and massive as possible. And that's, you know, again, it, if it's a pop thing, that's another sort of approach to where it's like, you know, then you're kind of doing a lot more parallel compression, maybe uh, almost no reverb, you know, that's kind of like, I guess how I would approach it in terms of signal chain differences is just, you know, what, what is it, what space are we in, you know, and, and what's, What's the style that people want to hear this, you know, played out in, basically? I'm really excited about the STL uh, Control Hub expansion pack. I mean, I went through all of my projects from the last, I don't know, six or seven years and just kind of called together what I think are kind of the, a lot of the highlights for me and go-tos of individual channel signal chains to, you know, bus signal chains. And honestly, the bus signal chains are where I do a lot of my work, especially in the film score work. I mean, I come here with this sort of like orchestral cinematic sort of approach to the expansion pack that I think fills a really nice uh, space there in what's available in the expansion packs. It's like out the gate, how we can get some really great trailer sounds, how we can get some really great massive action orchestral sounds. And we've kind of went through a lot of fine tuning just to get them the way we want and, uh, and respond the way that I'm used to hearing them respond. What people can expect from my expansion pack is a lot of really dialed in bus settings and individual channel settings for a lot of my go-to signal chains for strings, brass, woodwinds, choir, uh, solo vocals, and other basic you know elements like you know kick drums, snare drums, guitars, basses, uh, a lot of synth stuff where I've got some really great bus settings and individual channel settings for widening things out and really just kind of opening stuff up when, when it comes to uh, the sort of cinematic depth of, of synth sounds and things like that. And also some stuff for sampled strings, sampled orchestra, sampled uh, instruments that, that need help and stuff like that. So it's, it's really just kind of my basic toolbox of things that I'm always using on my projects and put them all basically into this expansion pack. So there's just a lot of great stuff in there that I think will be really cool starting points for building cinematic spaces, uh, mainly from a tone perspective, mostly EQ, compression and saturation, um, you know, leaving aside, you know, reverbs and delays and really just sort of focusing on tone. The presets uh, translated from the original signal chains, you know, really, really well. I was actually pretty blown away by how much was going on in a lot of these, because we had pretty deep signal chains on, on a number of these things, especially in my orchestral buses, because a lot of those 
signal chains for me are eight or nine plugins sometimes on the buses for strings or brass or choir. And they're doing a lot of different things. So it's usually tone plus EQ plus some various dynamic things and all sort of did exactly what I was used to hearing, you know, which was really exciting to me because now really without having to dive into getting these kinds of signal chains together and, and dialing them in, I've got a single preset or a single setting in my expansion pack that I could go to that I know, okay, you know, this is strings recorded at Sony, pull up the strings Sony one preset and, you know, I've got a really good starting point with a lot of great processing on it, good to go. So I'm really excited about it. I'm really excited for everybody to uh, get a chance to dive into them. Oh, my God. 